Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next two hours are devoted to learning something more just about the world of shoes and not about just the world of shoes and chips and sealing wax and maybe tripping on tongues, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might become, or how we might say it. <laughs> I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, and our chat room monitor, Andrea, await you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a terrific chat room with some wonderful folks that join us. So, Ravinder, tell us all about it, please. Yes, we have a lovely chat room. It's very informative, very enlightening, very amusing sometimes, too. So do come join us. That is at provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Amusing. I find that intriguing. What do you mean by amusing? Oh, we have fun in the chat room. It, it's a good group. So, yeah, it can be amusing sometimes in there with some of the comments people can make or some of the angles they take on the subject matter. It, it's fun. In this week's Spotlight, I wish to bring your attention to music and its role in our lives. Every week on this show, we get three musical favorites from our guests that we play when we come back from breaks. And then I ask, why this one and what does it tell us about who you are? It's often interesting, to say the least, the amount of self-disclosure that comes from this little exercise. For example, we have had guests who suggest everything is all about oneness, peace, plenty, and then they choose songs that sing the story of lost loves or get-even opportunities, even songs with lyrics that suggest life sucks and then you die. We have also caught the occasional guest who was truly ignorant of why they felt so strongly about their choices until we suggested the ever-present emerging pattern arising from their three selections. Music psychology has, for some time now, offered theories about our musical tastes that include everything from aptitude to personality type. Not long ago, one study suggested that you could determine one's social class from the music they liked. According to the study, which was published in the Canadian Review of Sociology, the breadth of taste is not linked to class, but class filters into specific likes and dislikes. The study asserted, quote, poorer, less educated people tended to like country, disco, easy listening, golden oldies, heavy metal, and rap. Meanwhile, their wealthier and better educated counterparts preferred genres such as classical, blues, jazz, opera, choral, pop, reggae, rock, world, and musical theater. Close quote. Now, personally, I'm relieved the researchers also pointed out that the breadth of taste is not linked to these sociological factors, since I... I admit, I enjoy country and oldies as much as I enjoy opera and jazz. In fact, I don't think I could run a 10K without my 60s music going on in my head. So Ravinder knows that if ever I were to suffer a severe dementia, need to be awakened, and she was to prompt that with music, it would be the 60s music. Or perhaps B.B. King playing the blues that she would play to wake me up. All right, all of that aside, a new study reported just this last week suggests that our thinking style is linked to our musical preferences. A team of psychologists at the University of Cambridge reported in the journal PLOS One, quote, that your thinking style, whether you are an empathizer who likes to focus on and respond to the emotions of others, or a systematizer who likes to analyze rules and patterns in the world, is a predictor of the type of music you like. It's interesting, all these things that we learn about psychology, because now we can begin to scale a new sort of test, and we'll put it up on Facebook, and we'll determine what kind of music you like. 
And perhaps then we can target, oh, I don't know, a charity at those who have strong empathizing feelings and so forth. According to David Greenberg of the psychology department at Cambridge, and again I quote, Although people's music choices fluctuate over time, we've discovered a person's empathy levels and thinking style predicts what kind of music they like. In fact, their cognitive style, whether they're strong on empathy or strong on systems, can be a better predictor of what music they like than their personality. Close quote. The article, which appeared in Science Daily, Continued with this observation, people who scored high on empathy tended to prefer mellow music from R&B, soft rock, and adult contemporary genres, unpretentious music from country folk and singer-songwriter genres, and contemporary music from electronica, Latin, acid jazz, and Euro pop. They disliked intense music such as punk and heavy metal. I guess based on that, I'm an empathizer. In contrast, people who scored high on systematizing favored intense music, but disliked mellow and unpretentious musical styles. The results proved consistent even within specified genres. Empathizers preferred mellow, unpretentious jazz, while systematizers preferred intense, sophisticated, complex, and avant-garde jazz. They further found that those who scored high on empathy preferred music that had low energy, gentle, reflective, sensual, and warm elements, or negative emotions, sad and depressing characteristics, or emotional depth, poetic, relaxing, and thoughtful features. Those who scored high on systematizing preferred music that had high energy, strong, tense, and thrilling elements, or positive emotions animated in fun features and which also featured a high degree of cerebral depth and complexity. The more we learn about music and how our brains process information, the more we discover just how important music is to all of us. It would appear that all of that old drumming and vocalization, etc., connected with so many ancient rituals may have roots deeper than we may think. Not only does it hold the ability to entrain the brain, but it can elicit very strong and lasting emotions to say nothing of connecting in a very real sense to who we are and our very cognitive life. So the next time you listen to someone's favorite music, listen with a new ear to what that says about them. And you might think about this when it comes to your own favorites. Your thoughts on this one, Ravinder? You know, I find that interesting. I mean, I like rules and patterns and stuff. I often search for rules and patterns in the world around me, you know, the way people behave and how everything works. But across the board, I like the gentler, emotional, softer music. It doesn't matter what genre of music you're talking about, you know. I mean, I like country western, but I like the quieter, gentler, emotional ones, you know. Just all the way through, although there are several categories of music that you mentioned there. I've got no clue what they are. What is acid jazz? You know, and and, and I find myself in the same place that you are. I mean, their they're music, the theme uh, song that comes from, um, oh, what is that uh, piece of music? Uh, oh, goodness, and it just ran out of my mind. Well, let's take another one. Um, there are pieces of music that we think of that are classical pieces of music today mm-hmm. that are just really driving. They're, you know, and there are uh, pieces of music that are adagio largo. And uh, and I enjoy them both. You know, a Bach fugue. How do you classify a Bach fugue? I would think that that would be a systematized kind of uh, music. And, and, I, and I think there is just something special about a Bach fugue that... Mm, just it it defies lexical ability to really you know define what it is that you're listening to it's something you have to feel when you're listening and and, and it, at least those are my thoughts at any rate i don't think it's quite as clear as this study says it is but it is very interesting how we can classify it All right, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. 
Last week, our guest was Amy Major, and we discussed spirit rescue. Jenny wrote, I loved your guest this week. She was so spontaneous and sincere, so practiced answers. No practice answers, and that is so refreshing. Anna wrote, when Amy was describing her youth and how she would get away from others to listen to the inner voices, I thought she was describing my own experiences. I'm now going to do what she did and test these voices to see if they're just in my head or something else. Now, Ravinder, that kind of reminds me of a comment you made last week. I had exactly the same thing, you know, the the stuff Amy was talking about, I totally related to, you know, I describe it in different words, but it's all things that I've talked to you about over the last 25 years, so I'm, you know, it's not just a convenient response, but yeah, I too decided to test it, and I'm still not sure if it was coincidence or not, Um, but I asked the higher power, whatever it is, I actually call them my friends. I decided they're just my friends. They're three friends. And I don't know if that's imagination. But I asked them, okay, give me proof. And as you're aware, I've been talking about the color pink for the last few years. But it's not the the bright pink that you see everywhere. It's the really pale baby pink. So I asked um, my higher whatever, okay, I want to see this color tomorrow. Now, it's a color that I really like. I want to buy it in clothing, but I can never, ever find it. I'm always searching for it. So I said, okay, tomorrow, show me that color, especially in an article of clothing. So the following morning, I get up, and hanging in the corner of our room is a clothes hook, and I've got two old bathrobes hanging up there. They're big and thick, so I don't wear them particularly. But the one that was underneath, that was just peeking out that I'd forgotten about. It's been there for years. Is this baby, baby pink? Is this really, really pale pink? So then I thought, ha, huh, that's just coincidence. Okay. So I tried it again that night. And the following day, we're out shopping. And what do I come across? In fact, I actually told my higher self, you're going to have to, you know, if this has to happen outside of the house now. I define the rules. And you're going to have to point it out to me because I kind of daydream. And there in the store was a pair of baby pink jeans for women, not in the baby clothes or anything. So, yeah, I'm still trying to trundle whether that's coincidence or not. But you it's know, still interesting. You look for color baby pink and then you go shopping store to store. You're apt to find it. Uh-uh. That's my, okay. I have searched for years. No way. I search and search for this particular shade. I'd say keep asking. That's what I'd <laughs> say. All right. And that theme song I couldn't remember is from the movie Troy. Oh, yeah. That one is. Okay. All right. Now, last week, our spotlight was all about new technologies that can be deployed to both read and program your thoughts. Brian wrote, man, when do we get to mind mending? I have to think that if Terrace McKenna were alive today, he would be encouraging people to explore different states of consciousness via frequency energy methods rather than chemical ones. One main takeaway I have from him is that establishments which benefit from directing human behavior put up a lot of social walls and laws to prevent individuals from exploring their minds and states of consciousness outside the parameters the organizations have established. It will be interesting to see if science is able to expand beyond the directly observable mechanistic modalities that have become the dogma of scientific faith. It was not so very long ago that many branches of science fell under the umbrella of philosophy. I think this separation has greatly reduced the humanness of scientific study and allowed science for profit at any moral cost to become every bit the Jekyll Hyde monster it has become. And also regarding last week's spotlight, Victoria wrote, Unfortunately, technological development has far outstripped moral development. As a consequence, humanity has reached and surpassed its Peter principle. Bottom line, we're destroying ourselves and taking the planet along for the ride. And I used to be an optimist. Moving on, Nick wrote, In the film Quantum Wisdom, Dr. Eldon Taylor gives us methods we can apply to our own lives to become better, healthier, and happier people. One of the most useful techniques for me personally, he learned in the Utah State Prison System. He was commissioned to find some way to help the inmates so they wouldn't commit more crimes and go back to jail. He actually created a three-sentence affirmation that worked. I thought this was amazing and wonderful that he could help so many men and women and their families. 
but I didn't know how powerful it was until a woman came to see me for the first time with three real crises that were going to happen within two weeks. She was in a hopeless situation on three fronts. I gave her Dr. Taylor's affirmations and told her to chant it aloud or silently all day, every day. She called me in six or seven days later to say every problem simply disappeared. I realized then how powerful those words are, so I gave them to anyone who needed a miracle. At one point, I had a list of 37 first names and the miracle that happened. I stopped taking notes, but I won't stop passing on Dr. Taylor's discovery. Well, thank you, Nick. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon at eldontaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. And I want to thank you all for your letters and comments. We truly appreciate your feedback and support. Now to this week's show, Top Brain, Bottom Brain, with Professor Stephen M. Coslin. I've been looking forward to this show. For years, there has persisted a common interpretation of the right brain, left brain dichotomy. Supposedly, if you're right brain dominant, you would be, a, you'd be good at linear matters, such as language and mathematics. While if you're dominantly right brained, you would excel at um, things like art and matters of a spatial uh, nature. Now, this is an overgeneralization, but it nevertheless fairly represents how many people, including several prominent folks in both academia, and the private sector have portrayed the two-brain stereotype. Enter today's guest, who argues that this portrayal is not based on solid science at all. Instead, he offers a new hypothesis for understanding how our brains actually work. Stephen M. Coslin is founding dean of the Minerva Schools at the Keck Graduate Institute. He was director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and Chair of the Department of Psychology, Dean of Social Science, and John Lindsay Professor in Memory of William James at Harvard University. He has authored or co-authored 14 books and over 300 scientific papers, and has received the NAS Initiatives in Research Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, three honorary doctorates, and election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to, Prov uh, to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Stephen M. Coslin. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's our pleasure, sir. I've been really looking forward to this show. Uh, and your theories. I loved your books. Actually, I loved all three of them. And we're going we're gonna to talk about those. But we like to establish three things in our interviews. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And how do we use it? So to that end... If we may, let's begin by having you tell us about yourself. What was your childhood like? Were you popular, involved in sports, a loner? What did you want to be when you grow up? Grew up. Hmm. I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm a native Californian, although most of my life I've spent on the East Coast now. But I'm I'm back in California. Um, it's true, by the way, what they say about you can't come home again. <laughs> um, not even the weather is the same. Um, I guess when I was younger, um, my earliest memories are uh, sitting in the back of a class in elementary school and uh, reading science fiction. And um, a lot of what I thought about was science and how it could change the world in interesting ways and the sort of role that I thought I might be able to play in doing that. Early on, I thought I would be some kind of an engineer would be involved in NASA or something like that. And it wasn't until the 60s that I got really interested in psychology, and that was a result of um, the whole social movement then, where I became very aware of various sorts of societal injustice and came to believe that education was the ultimate key to solving many of the world's ills. And in fact, the, this phase of my career now, that's exactly what I'm focusing on. We're starting a new university from scratch here, which is based on the science of learning. So it's sort of come full circle to what I, I really decided I wanted to do in high school. Uh, a lot of detours on the way, but it, it has come back to that. So, uh, you know, were you raised a, a, a spiritual person, a religious person? And how did, I mean, if that turned your career, uh, what predisposed you toward that? You know, I, I was raised in, in 
very secular environment, uh, Pacific Palisades. It's a, a suburb of Los Angeles, and the, the, the religion and spirituality were not even on the horizon. Just wasn't something that people seemed interested in. It took me years uh, before I started to have sensitivity to such things, and that was initially through personal experience. And then I started writing about it. Actually, I've, I've written several pieces on what God could be and how God might uh, interact with uh, ordinary humans in daily life, things like that. So I, I thought quite a bit about it and come to the conclusion that my former friend and colleague, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, was wrong when he claimed uh, his book, uh, Rocks of Ages, uh-huh. that there are two, what he called the Grand Magisteria, uh, great big domains, one for science and one for religion. And the two don't really have anything much to do with each other. They don't interact with different principles at work and different ways of knowing. Um, I just thought that was probably not right. And it's all one big thing. And that if there's a meaningful concept of God, it's, it's going to be one that's integrated in with the natural world in a way that makes contact with everybody and their daily lives. But that, this, I'm happy to talk about this, but this will take us a little far from top right bottom brain, just to be warned. Well, we have we've got ninety minutes at least now, and and I think that's a very important element to understand. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll bounce around with it. Maybe let me just ask you this: Now, you're a tenured professor at Harvard. Did you express these views at all to your colleagues there? Not much. Um, in fact, I. I think I just started writing about the theory of God right when I was leaving Harvard. But th- that was not the sort of thing that was discussed very widely. Um, I was on a committee of six faculty to redo general education at Harvard. There are two students on there as well. And one of the categories we suggested for, that all students should be exposed to was faith and reason uh, because we thought to understand the world as it is, and just also to have an orientation towards our culture, one should understand what faith is, where it comes from, and how it interacts with reason. Well, the faculty uh, rejected that, uh, not in a subtle way, and it ended up not being part of the program. Um, I think academia in general uh, is a little uncomfortable with questions of faith, And that may come from this mistaken view that faith and rationality are somehow in opposition to each other. And that if one has faith, that means one can't think and be analytical and critical and so forth. I suspect, I I, I don't know, but I I think, I'm sure there are people that have seriously written about this and thought about it deeply and uh, about why academia, at least American academia, tends to be uh, chary of discussions about these matters in, 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 in most regards. Uh, I'm not one of the people that's actually a scholar of such things, so these are just my personal opinions. I, I, I don't for what they're worth. Yeah, I, I think the paradigm just simply doesn't allow it, and I, I know we've we've spoken to a number of, uh, of guests um, who are on the leading edge of their fields, physics, philosophy, psychology, um, professors, tenured professors, who admit that uh, there's more than a reluctance to um, begin to address those sorts of issues within academia because they are so outside of the paradigm that it's uh, that's a good way for you to lose a possibility for tenor. We, we have a break coming up, uh, Professor Coslin. When I come back, I, I'd like you, if you would, to explain to me why you would leave a tenured position at Harvard to to start a university. We're speaking with Professor Stephen M. Coslin about his life, work, and books. To learn more about the professor, visit his website at Minerva, that's M-I-N-E-R-V-A, dot K-G-I dot E-D-U, Minerva dot K-G-I dot E-D-U. Okay, remember to join Ravinder and Andrea in the chat room, and you can do that by just simply going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment 
with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicky wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your Inner Talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Stephen Costlin about his life, work, and books. We ask our guests for three pieces of music, three of their favorites, music that has some genuine significance to them. And as you heard in the spotlight, well, music can awaken forgotten memories, and it's even restored lost states of consciousness. And it has some very practical relevance to many areas, other areas of our life. So, all right, Professor, we just played I'm So Tired by the Beatles. you got to tell us, why is this one special to you, and how does it instruct us about who you are, sir? Hello? Hello, Professor? Hi. Uh, did did you hear my question here. okay? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, is this a, I'm just curious, was this tailored for me in particular, or... or uh, this is something you would ask for that particular song? No. It, we ask all of our guests for three pieces of music. And, and you heard that in the spotlight uh, up right. front. And, okay. uh, you know, the, and the reason they do it very candidly is it gives us an insight as to who our guest is. And, um, you know, as, as I said to you in the beginning, it's important to know who the messenger is, uh, as well as the message and how we possibly could use it. And as you know, uh, because of your training, etc., there's very little about us that doesn't disclose something if you pay attention to it. So there's a bit of self-disclosure that's involved. So the question I'm asking you is a question I ask every guest that comes to this show, sir. Well, no, I, I had forgotten that I supplied you with the name of songs I like because I was struck by how much I like that song. And now I think back. And, uh, yeah, I was just confused because I, I play that song actually fairly frequently. I'm a bass player. I play bass guitar. Oh, you do? And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been playing for many years uh, with my wife and initially, initially with my kids. So we haven't left. Occasionally we come back, but for many years. Um, 
and many of them uh, can't afford it. We have to come up with money to help them. But our, our goal is to give them an absolutely first-rate education of the sort they wouldn't have access to otherwise, and to have them bond, to interact with each other in deep ways so that after they graduate, there'll be a, a network across the world of people who want to work together to make the world a better place. This is really what we're up for about here at Minerva. What a and we've, we've had our first class. It's a very small class. The first year was only 28 students just to make sure everything was working well. And then this coming one will be 115 or so. And then we'll, we'll keep growing in subsequent years. What a wonderful ambition. Uh, you, you have on-campus facilities. Do you have uh, open campus facilities as well at Minerva? Well, we don't have a campus. So one of our things is to reduce the cost. So our tuition is $10,000 a year. Uh, all of our students live together in residence halls, and they participate in extracurricular and co-curricular activities together that we've uh, organized. Uh, we treat the city as our campus, making use of public uh, resources such as libraries and so forth. Sure. All of their classes are actually taught over the computer, over the web, but they're all seminars. They're all real-time seminars that have no more than 18 students, and our students can sit around a table together if they want and take the classes together, physically together. Or they can be in a coffee house or anywhere else there's enough bandwidth. Um, the reason we do that is that we have been using the science of learning not so much to teach more effectively, but to help the students learn more effectively, teaching and learning different things. There's a lot known about how to get people to learn, which the major principle is just get them engaged. So by, by using active learning in seminars, Using the tools that we can do, uh, we can use on the computer, we're able to get students very engaged, and we record the classes and give them immediate feedback as to how they're doing, because the recordings are graded. They're using rubrics, they're not letter grades. That feedback goes back to the student about how well they were doing uh, with constructive information. So no one is ever surprised at Minerva. We don't have midterms and, and that, that sort of thing. It, it's really continuous um, engagement, activity, and uh, improvement, self-growth. Well, anyone, that is, very different anyone that's looked at your work is going to be interested in looking at, uh, at your new school, uh, university, minerva.kgi.edu. I invite you all to go check it out. All right, I want to discuss several things with you today, sir, if we may. Um, because your work is so broad, uh, and, and, and if we can, let me begin by asking you about your paper, Using Neuroimaging to Resolve the Psi Debate. I know you co-authored that with uh, Samuel Moulton. In, in the yeah. paper, you conclude that Psi does not exist. Uh, now, we've hosted more than one academic uh, on this show that totally would disagree with that conclusion. I mean, Dean Radin, Rupert Sheldrake, Stuart Hameroff, Gene Houston, Ron Mallett, Fred Allen, well, on and on and on. Please share with yeah. our audience how you arrived at that reasoning. Well, what, what we actually said is we had no evidence that psi exists. Right. So we have to be careful here because... Uh, Absence of evidence does not constitute evidence of absence. Uh, Christoph Koch once said that to me. That was uh -huh. a clever way to put it. You, you can't ever affirm the null hypothesis. You can't say that something doesn't exist. It's, it's a, in science, you can't do that. You but can't you do that can with anything, say, though. I mean, you can't do that with God right. or anything else. Okay. So right. it, it, it's right. really incumbent, is it not, upon those people that would marshal up something that calls upon a supernatural to deliver evidence to the contrary? Correct. So we tried. I mean, we really tried in that study to stack the decks to get what, if there was going to be any evidence, we would pick it up, at least within the confines of what we did. So it was a brain imaging study. 
Uh, we use three different kinds of, of um, I guess call it um, uh, uh, ESP if you, if you want to. Um, and we found no evidence. So we had the sense we showed we had the sensitivity to pick up other subtle effects in the brain scanning piece, but we didn't get evidence for this. So look, you can think that all these anecdotes that have been reported are not lies. They're not reported by fools. That there's probably something going on that we don't understand. But it's not the kind of thing that's easily brought into the lab, and it's not the kind of thing that's easily documented. So if we're going to get anywhere and figure out what's going on with these sorts of phenomena, assuming, assuming they actually do exist, we've got to have rigorous standards about how we document them and investigate them. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. No, I agree. So we tried one method that did not work. That doesn't mean that somebody else won't come up with a better method and provide evidence. And we would like to encourage them to try. But they've got to use very rigorous, scientifically acceptable standards, or it's not going to make any difference in the scientific community. Do you think it's possible, sir, that we just we don't look in the right place, that we're just really looking in the wrong place when we're monitoring you know, a, a human being. Uh, what comes to my mind is Ingo Swan, who did a lot of remote viewing for the military and and um, SRA, uh, Stanford Research Associates, uh, uh, with people like Charles Tart and Major Edward Dames. I'm sure you know who he is. But Ingo suggests that there isn't, you know, there isn't something unique that really happens to him. Uh, it isn't like you could expect to see a, a, a new a P300 wave emerge, uh, you know, some cortical evolt potential or blood pressure increase, uh, that it's just a very natural process like breathing. Do you think that, that maybe we're just looking in the wrong place or in the wrong way when we're trying to um, objectify psi phenomena? It's certainly possible. Um, I don't know of any evidence against that idea. Uh, if, if one accepts that at least some of the anecdotes uh, really are outside the realm of what we can at least easily explain within the confines of normal science, um, then our failure to be able to systematically document and repeat those phenomena would suggest exactly what you're saying, that we've not been looking at it the right way and we've been looking uh, in the wrong places. For these kinds of phenomena. I mean, my, my sense of this stuff, if it exists, and I, I'm an agnostic on this, uh, I just don't know one way or the other, um, if, if, it, if it exists, it's probably a higher order interaction effect in a statistical sense uh, that it's going to depend, and a lot of researchers in the field have, have that same idea, by the way, it's going to depend on a confluence of factors coming together in just the right ways, and people have guessed at what those factors might be, and so far, as far as I can tell, not come up with solid evidence for them. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they won't tomorrow. Right. But I think I think the bottom line with these kinds of things, for me, it comes down to Pascal's wager, which is an argument for believing in God, yeah. which you probably know. Yeah. So do, I, do you want me to explain what that is? Or? Go ahead. Yes, please do. Yeah. Okay, so imagine a two-by-two two table where uh, the columns are God doesn't exist, God does exist. And the rows are uh, you believe, you don't believe. So you have four cells. So what he does, he goes through the cells and he says, okay, if God doesn't exist and you don't believe, fine. Uh, you gain a few Sundays here and there, whatever, that you might have spent in church. Um, if God does exist and you do believe, that's very good. Um, and then he goes through the cell. The critical cell is goes through the cells. The critical cell is the one where God does exist and you don't believe. Yeah. So his argument is the negative consequences of that compared to the positive consequences of believing 
if God does exist, then minor things are lost. If you believe and God doesn't exist, you know, you miss a few Sundays or things like that, which may be compensated by other things. His argument is, you know, when you look at the trade-offs, just from a purely rational point of view, it makes sense to believe in God. That's Pascal's wager, as, as I understand it. Right. <clears throat> so and, and so I, I think that, that the reason I bring it up is I think that way of looking at things is, is quite broad. So if you decide to dismiss that extrasensory phenomena simply don't exist, let's go do something else. Well, what if you're wrong? You'll never discover it. So, true, true. you know, you can set up a matrix just like that for these kinds of phenomena, and then you have to think about what the trade-offs are. I mean, if, if these things exist, we really should find out and learn about them. And what's lost if we decide they they don't exist, and they do, is so much more proportionally likely to affect us as individual and as species than the other cells. Do you see what I'm driving at here? I don't know if that's clear or not. You know, it's too bad that the academic institutions, per se, do not take Pascal's wagers seriously and invite this kind of research and study as opposed to view it as outside the acceptable standards of academia. And, and 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 I guess you know when you look at Pascal's ragers, you have to remember Anthony Flew's parable of the gardener as well, because we have to. I like the way you use agnostic in this context. We have to remember that just because I want to believe something doesn't necessarily mean that it's 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 there. I mean, maybe we're looking for microwave with a radio set, uh, and we're never going to discover it. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe there is no such thing. So it, it I, I think you I mean, I concur absolutely that it should be um, an area of inquiry embraced by academia. So everything is full of trade-offs. So especially these days when there's so few funds out there, um, you know, here I am involved in setting up a university. And we need scholarship money uh, in order to bring students from all over the world to have this this opportunity. The, the question is, should what is the role of government in funding this? I mean, I, I agree with what you just said. I think it, it should be investigated. But I would hope that some of these billionaires who have enormous resources and are looking for an opportunity to make a difference uh, would recognize that there are areas of research that the government won't go near, although they have in the past, but they won't go near now because I think in large part there's been some appreciation of the trade-offs involved with limited resources in terms of, given the past, how likely is it that there will be something that's useful that comes out of it. I think there's some calculations that have been made at the funding agencies, but that shouldn't affect an individual or group that has enormous private resources and would like to be in a position to make a difference by encouraging something the governments won't do. I mean, this seems to me a perfect opportunity. So for, we, um, you know, have, I'm, I'm at the northern end of Silicon Valley here, and there's just an enormous amount of resources around this place. Yeah, so, you know, all those philanthropists out there listening to us, uh, you know, this is the man to go to. He's the guy that can run this kind of research, you know, put a team together to do it, um, and, and and it's important research to be done. Uh, Professor, we have a break in about just under two minutes, and, and I'm going to tease in this question, uh, but then we're going to have to go for a break. Yeah, for many years, I conducted forensic hypnosis examinations, uh, and, and you've done quite a bit of work with hypnosis, and to many hypnotists, you're the authority. They They suggest that, you know, if you want to know whether or not hypnosis is real, you know, look at the work of uh, Professor Coslin. Um, now, what they generally do not mention is your attitude toward how hypnosis can be abused or misused, like stage hypnosis. So now I'm going to quote you. My sense is that hypnosis shows trivialize what's really interesting and also leads many people to dismiss hypnosis as nothing but stage show silliness. 
I'm going to ask you when we come back from the break why you believe that is so and, and what exactly, you know, is hypnosis all about? How does that relate to the imaging work that you have uh, done and, and, and your book on that subject? Well, if you'd like to know more about Professor Stephen Coslin, his life, work, and books, Top Brain, Bottom Brain, my favorite, clear and to the point, and that is it, it, for any and all of you out there that do uh, PowerPoint displays or if you're a Mac guy and you use Keynote uh, like I do, that is an absolutely incredible book, uh, Eight Psychological Principles for Compelling PowerPoint Presentations, uh, a must read, and The Case for Mental Imagery, his third book that I have in my own library. Visit his website at minerva.kgi.edu. Now, we have a video for you during the break featuring our guest, Top Brain, Bottom Brain Theory, which we'll get to in this next hour. Uh, and you can check it out by joining the chat room. So just go to ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Gotcha by Eldon Taylor exposes just how far the reach of propaganda, brainwashing, and public manipulation has advanced. You will learn about the many covert activities designed to marginalize your freedoms and educate you to march in lockstep with the agenda of the so-called elite, including advanced technologies used to subvert resistance. 1984 has arrived and the plutocracy is in charge, and most are totally unaware of just how deep the tentacles reach. They don't want you to have this book. There have been broken deals and even indirect threats designed to stop Gotcha from being published. Set for release in September, you can pre-order it now at the discount price of $19.88, with free freight to anywhere in the world. For details, go to eldentaylor.com forward slash gotcha. Don't wait, get your copy while you can. That's eldentaylor.com forward slash gotcha. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Professor Stephen M. Coslin about his work and books. Now, Professor, we just played your second musical choice, In My Life by the Beatles. So, tell us, why is this one special? It um, indicates how each of us is standing on a mass of memories, a big pile but we're not just standing on it, it actually permeates us. So what we are uh, is in large part part product of what we've been. And there's some poignancy to that song, I think. 
because it, it, it could have been different, but it worked out fine. Said like a scholar who's had time to reflect upon what it is that I shall tell you about the meaning of this song, sir. Two Beatles songs, and uh, you've got to have a lot of rich memories coming out of Harvard and the colleagues and, you know, the associations and, and of course, Stanford. And, and now you're at Minerva, and, and a lot of that has been, you know, would be barren by comparison. Does uh, the song have anything to do with as you reflect on your, your memories in your life? Oh, maybe a little bit. Um, it, it, it's interesting. It, it, it's tempting to think about the missing, the path not taken. You know, sometimes I think about this idea of a multiverse, where there, there's an infinite number of universes, right. and that we just happen to be in one of them. Right. And that there are new ones splitting off all the time. Yeah, it's, it's tempting to think about your alternative self who took a different path. But I don't think there's any real point in doing that. It's not productive unless your goal is to try to abstract out some general principle or rule that can guide you going forward. It's, it's really not very productive. I've spent a lot of time looking back just, just for its own sake. Don't you agree? Well, you know, I think moments of melancholy can have their refreshing side as well. I, I suppose... Uh, I relate to what you're saying, and uh, and there are there are many times in my own life that I look back and think if I'd have done this or hadn't done this, you know how different things might be. Uh, and you know, again, you're probably right. If you use, if you learn from something, it becomes constructive. But on the other hand, huh. there is just a flavor, uh, a special flavor about looking back uh, as well. And so that's why I say moments of melancholy. Well, you know, I, I, I'm one of these people that uh, I have to watch my diet, you know, and so there are things like chocolate that I enjoy that I don't eat. Uh, but it's okay to have a piece from time to time. I guess that's how I look at it. Okay. Can't argue with that. <laughs> Listen, I, I love your candor and your and your honesty, sir. You you are a man to admire. Let's go to my question, Thank the you. setup for my question before um, we went to the break. Why is hypnosis trivialized, in your view, in so many different venues? I mean, you, the, your paper aims strictly at stage show silliness, but we see a lot of trivialize. Tri, yeah, anyway. Uh, in in many other areas, so why would you say it's trivialized, sir? Well, I, I think the evidence. So the, the issue that we examined was there are two big theories of hypnosis. Um, one is the kind of play acting theory, uh, which is there really isn't a special state in the mind, the brain. Uh, it's just a role that people assume. When they, they go through the induction process, they have images of what they're supposed to be like, and they just follow those. The other theory is that there really is something special, and that the brain really does respond differently when you're in a hypnotic state than when you're not. So we, we uh, one of the studies we did, we had people look at what looked like Mondrian patterns, squares, rectangles, that either were in color or they were just grays. No hue at all, no color. Right. And we asked them to see them as they were, or if it was in color, to mentally drain the color. So making it just with force of mind alone look as if it was in gray, or the other way around, if it was actually in gray that we we're showing them, we asked them to add the color. And we did this both when they were hypnotized and when they weren't hypnotized. And what we found was there are, there are well-known areas in the brain that are involving color, and that's one of the reasons we set up the experiment this way, because we knew exactly where to look. And sure enough, when they are hypnotized, you get a kind of supercharging in the brain in just the relevant area, where when they're hypnotized, they can really project that hallucination. So they increase the amount of activity in that brain area when they're asked to add color, 
whereas when you're asked to drain it, it actually ramps it down. So it, this is above and beyond what you can do just with mental imagery without hypnosis. So we had, I think, very good evidence that hypnosis really does modulate what the brain is doing, uh, allowing it to go to extremes that it ordinarily doesn't doesn't do. So I think that's an extremely powerful tool to be used in psychotherapy and, and self-learning and various other kind of contexts. And just to trivialize it by making it a stage show thing uh, undermines its potential value to individuals and society in, in general. I so agree. I so totally agree. Uh, let me ask you this, though, now. When we talk about memory, images, um, and, and, you know, I have, as I said earlier, I've used forensic hypnosis for years, and very often it was with a witness, and we would recover information, but on occasion it was under circumstances that really surprised me. One that comes to my mind was a homicide case where the, the individual was actually convicted of uh, the murder of his mother. He's in the prison system, and on that given night, he claims he had no recollection. Um, he'd done a lot of drugs, and he drank a lot of alcohol. He'd been at a party, da-da-da-da-da. Well, the long story short is, under hypnosis, he was able to tell us everything that took place on that given evening. And I hypnotized him within the prison system. We recorded it. We took down all the detail. Among the detail was a story he told us about law enforcement collecting garbage in a park, which gave us access to a time. We could we could determine when law enforcement had stopped in the gar or in the park to search this garbage that he hid and watched. Now he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol, had no conscious recollection, and yet you know, again, under hypnosis gives us such detail that it, it, in the end, exonerated him, and we did get the real perpetrator, but that's not the point of the story. Do you think that our memories are all virtually stored somewhere and that that the problem with the memory isn't that the memory is gone, but the retrieval system or method or access is what's missing? I, I almost think that. Um, I think you're absolutely right to focus on the retrieval mechanism, that there's much, much more information that's in there than we're able to get to. But the one piece where I think I disagree with the way you just laid it out was uh, I think memory is very much a constructive activity, that we don't so much store, to use a metaphor, photographs as fragments of photographs. Mm -hmm. And when we remember, we very often have to assemble those fragments, and there's some error that can creep in as a consequence of that. Absolutely. So that that point uh, is sort of in a way orthogonal to what you just said, um, because I do agree with the idea that we have much, much more story than we can get to voluntarily, and that the trick with memory in large part is figuring out how to dig it out. So I, I, I think there's lots and lots of evidence that's correct. So, so let me ask you this, because I, I, I've had an issue with this myself. Uh, you, you know, people will use hypnosis for past life recall. And let's just take this constructive element you're talking about. And my understanding, and you, you're the expert on that, is, look, every time I remember, every time I, I tell you what it is that I remember, I may modify that. Indeed, it changes over time. And uh, and it, it, it memory, as you say, are, are, are these little pieces that we then try and put together. And uh, the mind has a great way of confabulating uh, to create stories that make sense to us, or and, and on and on. Uh, but but yeah. my question is, what kind of validity do you give to um, hypnosis used in a past life scenario, if any at all? You know, I never thought about that. I'd have to think about it. There are, there are a lot of uh, underlying assumptions that have to be considered, uh, like the very idea of past lives. Uh, there are many more of us living today than have ever lived before. So does that mean some of us don't have past lives, or does it mean that 
uh, past life is duplicated. It, groups of us actually have the same past life. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. Um, I don't. I don't, I'm not bothered so much by the fact there's no mechanism that's known. This goes back to the earlier discussion about ESP. Right. That there's there's no good theory of how information that's been accumulated over the course of a past life would be transmitted to someone now. How would that information come along? I'm not so much bothered by that. Um, but I am I am bothered by this issue of, of there's just not enough to go around. Um, I guess maybe I, 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 for these kinds of things, I'm often driven by my intuitions that, you know, with, with respect to the God issue, for example. Right. Um, that then leads me to try to reconstruct things rationally in certain ways. This one I have no intuitions about at all. But my, my the scientist in me immediately starts to be critical about the idea that everyone um, has embedded somewhere in there information about a past life that he or she lived. I, I find I find that uh, difficult. I, I I share that, and you know, and I'm afraid I, I think that that is an area that often, to use your term. Uh, trivializes the real value of hypnosis. That said, however, uh, past life therapies, uh, they can be pretty, pretty powerful, but it doesn't then matter whether or not the person really had a past life if what we've done is resolve a current issue on the basis of their belief in a past life. Uh, I'll add that caveat. Before we get... Uh, in fact, go ahead, sir. No, no, I mean, you're making a more general point, which was that all we have is our perceptions right. of reality. That that's that's what we have. So that idea can extend in multiple different ways, which you just very nicely did, by the way. I think what you just said was was correct. Let, let me ask you this, Professor uh, Carl Prebrum's theory of holographic memory stories is something we've discussed on this show uh, several times, and. And, and some of the research with maze-bright rats where portions of the brain have been systematically removed and the rat remain maze-bright, if we may. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with all of this. Despite removing all of these different areas of the brain, is it conceivable, do you believe, that the holographic model of information storage is a viable model today based on all that we know? Uh, this is the kind of answer you're going to hate. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, yeah, at least in humans, uh, there's good evidence that parts of the brain that are involved in registering visual information during perception, when your eyes are open, you're looking at something, are also involved in visual memory. And that areas of the brain that are involved in spatial information, knowing where you are relative to other things, while you're walking around, are also involved in remembering those things, and and so forth. So areas that are involved, the brain that are involved in getting information in in the first place, play a role in, in subsequent storage. So, so it's not that the brain as a whole is kind of um, one big holographic memory. That that's not the case as far as the evidence suggests. But so that was the no part. I should have said no and yes. The yes part is within an area, I don't think it's the case as a single brain cell, a neuron that's going to store the, your memory of your, your grandmother, that I think it's distributed. I think it, it actually could be modeled from the perspective of a holographic memory within one of these areas. So I guess I think it's kind of local holographic memory. So it's not the whole thing. But some parts of it have that kind of distributed, uh, a lot of redundancy. I mean, all that makes a lot of sense to me. So the entire brain is not the holographic film plate, but areas of the brain may well be storing as the film plate. Did I get that right? That's, that's my suspicion. I mean, it, 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 it seems to fit the data reasonably well. Now, if you get a real memory expert, someone like Larry Squire or Dan Schachter in here, they may differ, and I would defer to them because they know a lot more than I do about this. 
but from what I have read and what I, I know, it, it makes sense. All right. Let's move to your books directly, sir. I, I, I enjoyed reading uh, about the four rules of PowerPoint, the Goldilocks rule, the Rudolph rule, the rule of four and the birds of a feather rule. Uh, and your work, you know, has provided you with so many practical insights that have a direct bearing on all forms of communication, including, I would suggest, that which goes on within our minds, our so-called stream of consciousness, if you will. So before we adventure into the four cognitive modes advanced in your top-down model of the brain, please unpack the four rules of PowerPoint um, that I read in your delightful book. And I mentioned before we went to this last break, Clear and to the Point, uh, the title of the book, Clear and to the Point, Eight Psychological Principles for Compelling PowerPoint Presentations. Unpack yeah, those so principles, correct, please. So there are eight of them. I mean, the four... Correct what you just said. There's the right. other half. There are four more of them. But the, the general idea behind it is that we've learned a huge amount about how perception, memory, comprehension, and, and so forth, all these cognitive kinds of functions, how they, how they work, and that we can use that information systematically to help communicate better. So I got, I got interested in this because, I, as you mentioned earlier, I was chair of the department and one of the duties was to go to every talk that was presented right. in the department by visitors and graduate students. And I started noticing that we had these world experts coming in, and their presentations were really difficult to follow. And I started taking notes why. So the, the epiphany came when I saw a slide that used um, one of the prefab um, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint uh, templates, which I think was called Celestial. Okay. And what it was was a background of the planet Saturn, which was very white with bands on it and rings around it. They're also white on a black background in space and lots of stars. So this guy had a slide with that background and he had, there must have been 500 words in tiny font in white. So not only was there too much for you to be able to get your eye focused on it, not only was the font so tiny you could barely distinguish the differences between the letters, but he also had white letters going over the white planet and the white rings, so they were invisible. And he was totally unaware of this. He would, a slide came up, and he was talking about it and pointing to it, and I, I'm sitting there in the audience, I'm saying, this guy has got to know better. He's got to know there are resolution limits to what perception can re register. He's got to know you have to have a certain level of contrast, you're not going to be able to see it. He's got to know if there are too many words, it's going to be crammed together and you have trouble focusing your eyes on the appropriate parts. So then I started taking very detailed notes, not of the content of presentations, but rather of their slides and what they were doing. And that's, that's where those principles came from, organizing those errors and thinking about what he's, they should have done based on what we know um, from the, the literature. Uh, and, it, and following that, we did a study where we downloaded 100 and something uh, randomly selected, well, actually stratified for different types of organization, PowerPoint presentations, and analyzed them according to those eight principles. Mm -hmm. And none of them were perfect. And most of them have multiple problems of the sort that would get in the way of communication. So if you want, I can go through those four and explain what they are if you want to do them one at a time. Yeah. Uh, you, you, let, me, let me ask you this first. I, I mean, I would like that. In fact, I have to tell you that, you know, I got started doing I did radio years and years ago, and I just got tired of doing it. And uh, then uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, I decided... What I'd really like to do is uh, something I dreamed of doing when I was a child, an imaginary round table, but it wouldn't have the knights at it. It would have the brightest minds on the planet there. And, and, and I would be able to just ask them questions, you know, the Aristotles and the Plato's, the, the yes. Heisenberg's and, and the Einstein's. And, and, and I'll tell you, Professor, 
I am enjoying this show because I would seat you at that table any time. Um, oh, thank you. You're very kind. Well, I, I don't know about kind, but I'm 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 compelled to be truthful. So I would love to have you flesh that out. But we also have a time limitation. Let me ask you some questions that might be more relevant to our listening audience. I've heard that when you do a PowerPoint, you should not use it as your notes for what you're going to say. And I've also heard the opposite of that. You should use it for your notes. What's your take on that, sir? Um, I'm not sure there's a one-size-fits-all here. Uh, I think the idea behind use it as your notes is try not to have to rely on your memory too much because you get a little jangled, a little anxious in front of all those people and so on. Uh, it, it puts a lot more load on you to try to have to keep remembering things. So to the extent that you use the PowerPoint as notes, it relieves strain. Now, the trouble using PowerPoint as notes is that you might be tempted to put too much information there. Right. That you don't want to overwhelm your audience, and you don't want them reading everything you're saying because they'll read at different rates. So if you're talking and they're reading, many of them would be at different places and they're, where they're reading from where you're talking, and it becomes difficult. It makes it strain for them. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have another to alternative you. is... I'm going to have to ask you to hold it there, Professor. We've got a break. I don't want the computer to kick us out. When we come back, we can pick that up. We're glad you tuned okay. in today. We know you have many choices, and we're grateful you chose to join us. We love your feedback, so please join me on Facebook and or drop me an email at Eldon at EldonTaylor.com. I love sharing my uh, your letters and comments on the show, and that's a great way for you to participate. And I would encourage you once again to visit Professor Costlin's website, uh, and check out his books. All right, we'll be right back following this brief message. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Gotcha! The explosive new book by New York Times bestselling author Eldon Taylor explores the 24-7 bombardment of information designed to win the hearts and minds of the public. He demonstrates how new sound bites are championed into personal awareness, becoming memes of the culture. Your very decision process is being managed and manipulated, and the quest for discovering your real self becomes exponentially more difficult, if not impossible, as a result. Pre-order now. EldonTaylor.com slash gotcha. Hi, I'm Eldon Taylor, and you're listening to Provocative Enlightenment Radio. I'm so glad you could join me as we tackle those tough questions in search of the answers that really matter. But remember, this is a journey we are undertaking together, so I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Please send your comments to Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com. You can also join in the conversation by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor, that's D-R-E-L-D-O-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Now, Back to the show.
Welcome back. We've been chatting with Professor Stephen Coslin about his life, work, and books, Top Brain, Bottom Brain, Clear and to the Point, and The Case for Mental Imagery. Three great books. In this half hour, we will take your calls, so if you have questions, give us a call or advance your comments and questions in our chat room. And remember, I love your feedback, and a great place for that is on Facebook, so I invite you to join me there today. All right, Professor, we just played your third musical choice, Nowhere Man by the Beatles. Please tell us why this one. Oh, I love the fact that he refers back. It's not just about other people. It's about us, too. That uh, it's very, very easy to go on automatic pilot, not be mindful, uh, and just cruise through life without seeing much of what's going on or thinking about what you really want to do. And it's easy to see this in other people and much harder to see it in ourselves. It's a wonderful song. Uh, sir, before the break, you were, you know, answering questions about, uh, you know, your PowerPoint book. And, 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 and rather than... Go ahead and have you flesh that out. We have only got a half hour. What I want to do is go directly to your top-down, bottom-down uh, model if we can. So your work basically begins by comparing the top-down to the right-left versions of the hemispheres of the brain. And your initial assertion is that the brain laterality that is so popular is not based on science. Now, I think this statement mm -hmm. can be easily misunderstood. There's a lot of research demonstrating specialization of hemispheres ranging from the simple Stroop test to the research by Michael uh, Gonzaniga and Roger Sperry in the 60s on split brain patients and, and so forth. And I know you know all about that. So please flesh out for us exactly what you mean when you say there is no scientific basis to the lateralization dichotomy. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, there's no question that the left brain and right brain do different things, just to be absolutely clear about that. Um, but the things they do are not the things you read about in the popular press. So, um, so for example, you mentioned Mike Gazaga, who I've published with, uh -huh. uh, studying these split brain patients who've had their hemispheres surgically disconnected to help them treat otherwise intractable epilepsy. Um, what we found is when you form a mental image, the one hemisphere is better at putting together parts than the other. Okay? Uh, we've also done research showing that one hemisphere is better at coding whether something is left of or right of another thing, whereas the other hemisphere is better at, the, at coding the exact distance. Or uh, during language, one hemisphere is better at picking up a tone. This is the right hemisphere. The left is better at grammatical kinds of things. Right. The differences, what I'm trying to say is the differences between the hemispheres are a much more precise and detailed level than what you read about in terms of intuitive versus creative and so forth. So that's, that's one problem. Another problem is the brain is not siloed in that way. It's a big system. The parts are always interacting. So you think about language. Yes, it's true. The grammatical stuff is better in the left hemisphere. But the tone-based stuff and indirect kinds of language, like a metaphor, are better in the right hemisphere. But they work together. To understand something, they're working together. And that's true in general. The left and right parts are working together. So if you look at brain imaging, when people are doing various kinds of cognitive activities, you don't find that some people are just using the left part of their brain and some are using the right part of the brain. Everybody's using the whole brain. It's interacting. Um, so it's, it's not the case that some of us rely on the left part and some rely on the right part. The left and right are deeply integrated. Okay. Now, I, I think that makes that clear. Then... Explain to us what you mean by the four cognitive modes uh, of information processing. Yeah, so 
taking this idea that you can't consider parts of the brain in isolation. It's one big system right. that's interacting, which is not to say that you can't say parts of it are specialists, because they are. Parts of, different parts of the brain do different things. But the things they do are defined within the context of the whole. It's all the, it's all working together. So what we did, the we in this case is Wayne, Willer, my, uh, Wayne uh, Miller, my co-author, mm -hmm. is said, well, let's see what we can characterize where there's very good evidence that the parts of the brain are doing different things, and then think about how they interact and use that as a springboard. We're talking about differences in personality or the like. So it turns out there's a, a long literature looking at the top part of the brain versus the bottom part. And for reasons I don't understand, this never got out of laboratory into the into public consciousness. People just don't know about it. But it started off with visual things, where the, the bottom part was shown to be involved in, in recognizing shapes, uh, like faces or common objects, whereas the top is doing location, uh, where you are in space. And then for their research, push the visual part into memory, so it turns out that you have separate memories for the nature of things versus where they are and so forth, and those are also bottom versus top. And then it turned out that the top, the frontal parts is involved in setting up plans and uh, monitoring what's going on to see if you've made an error with respect to what you expected, various things like that. Uh, the bottom, uh, you find that the recognition of shapes goes directly to areas that associate that kind of information with strong emotion and so forth. So you can characterize the top and the bottom. Um, and we did this using what are called meta-analyses. We did many, many studies and looked for common commonalities that cut across them. And then you ask the question, okay, if you can characterize the top and the bottom, you know they're always interacting. What can you say about those interactions? So we, we said, well, uh, imagine that people are, just a rough approximation, uh, very good at using top versus not so good. Um, and by the way, everybody uses both parts of the brain all the time. We, we would not survive two minutes if we didn't. So when I say very good, I mean above and beyond the sort of minimal you need to function, right. sort of optional ways you can use it. Um, so we set up a little two-by-two two table um, where... On the top, they say that the, on the top you would label the columns in terms of the top part of the brain as being um, very, very well utilized in optional kinds of ways or not. And then you do the same thing for the rows with the bottom part of the brain. So you now come up with four cells where both are being used in optional kinds of ways. We call that mover mode. So you can, you set up plans, you can monitor what's happening. Uh, using so the setting up plans top brain, you can do subtle multi-step plans, monitor what's going on, and use that to correct your plans as they're ongoing. So the monitoring what's going on in part involves classifying what you're seeing by the bottom brain. So if you're you're very good at both, you're in a position to uh, make effective plans and, and make sure they stay on track. Uh, versus if you're very good at the top and use it in optional ways, but not so good at the bottom. We call that stimulator mode because it's like you could be a bull in a china shop. Mm -hmm. You come up with plans, but you don't monitor how they unfold very well and don't correct them. Um, another cell was if you're not very good at the top, but very good at the bottom. So, so you're, you're not very good at coming up with elaborate plans, but you're very, very good at classifying what's going on around you and understanding what's going on. We call that perceiver mode, uh, where you can really register what's going on very accurately, but maybe not be so good at initiating complex plans. And finally, the last cell, which you don't use either the top or bottom in, in uh, optional ways very much, we call that adapter mode, uh, where you're willing to go along with plans and other people may have formulated and carry them out uh, according to the plan. Now, one thing I need to emphasize, no one of these modes is necessarily better. People always want to say, oh, I want to be a mover mode. Mm -hmm. Well, in the book, we talk about some of the disadvantages 
of being in some of the modes. Like mover mode can be very exhausting. Um, the other caveat is the modes may vary in different contexts. So we have a test in the book to figure out your default mode, the mode that all other things being equal you're likely to function in. You know, I have um, to ask but, you, let me interrupt you just a second if I can, because sure. I scored 41 on the top and 28 on the bottom, which if I understand everything correctly suggests that I'm a stimulator. I'm curious, what did you score, Professor, and which mode do you fall under? I was a weak mover. Well, so I, I forget, uh, try, um, I don't know, I think in the book we didn't use the word weak because it sounded bad, but what it means is I was a marginal mover that I'm affected by context a lot. Oh. So a stimulator is a perfect default mode for a radio talk show host. <laughs> well, good. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I want you to no, continue, but I, I, I just had to know what you scored. It's a great test. I, everybody needs to take it. Go on, please. It's online, so it's very quick and automatically scored. But but it is that is the sort of in general mode, and people will be different in different contexts, like at home, Sometimes it work, so forth, because it depends partly on what you know as to how good of plans you can come up with, how detailed they can be, that's top brain stuff, and also how well you can understand and interpret what's going on the bottom brain stuff. So you can be in specialized contexts and, and adopt different modes. But one of the things we emphasize in the book is a way to think about this is if you have a particular task to do, who do you want to work with? So what kind of person is going to complement your strengths and fill in for your weaknesses? So there's a second edition of this book, you know, paperback, that came out a couple of months ago, which has been substantially rewritten. I think it's much clearer than the original one was, which really emphasizes this. This is now in the second chapter. really emphasizes the importance of realizing that we're social beings and we typically are interacting with other people and we're doing something important and that it's important to know yourself, but also appreciate how you're going to interact effectively with people who are different from you. Well, you know, there's a two-part value, I think, uh, to this, uh, I guess we call a duplex model of the brain. Uh, the first is, of yeah. course, in self-understanding, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I don't believe that we'll ever understand ourselves uh, to the extent that we, we can cease self-analysis so bottom line is th that to me is an ongoing process that's a part of the journey you're reevaluating on a steady basis and, and and that is what life is really all about the second part however is in how you utilize those talents and we are social animals and we all work with other people we all are involved in projects or events or we all try to understand other people i think one of the reasons right brain left brain ideas caught on was because it gave insight it provided insight to how we operate it and how other people operate i think that's a, a genuine value to this book because unlike the the characterization that, oh, gosh, you know, if I'm right brain, that means I'm artistic. I should, you know, take up music. And if I'm left brain, that means I'm mathematical. Unlike those broad generalizations, this material actually gives rise to usable uh, day in, day out ways that we can we can improve our lives. Have I got that right? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm gratified that you understood it so well and so deeply. Thank you. No, oh, it's my pleasure. I, You know, w one of the things that I was taken by was the story, the way you interpreted the story of Phineas Gage. I've never yeah. heard that example, uh, it, his example explained in the same way. I think most people are, you know, they, they've heard about Phineas Gage, but... I'm sure they've never heard your interpretation. Share that with us, would you please? Sure. So Phineas Gage, famously foreman building a railroad, I think it was in New Hampshire, um, was tamping some blasting powder into a hole, a, a granite hole, with an iron tamping rod. He had a custom-made one that looked like a metal spear, basically very narrow at the top and then tapers to broader, um, what, about a yard long or something? I've seen this thing. I 
don't remember the exact length, but it's big. Somebody had called to him. He moved his head to one side, hit the side of the hole with the tapping. Well, it caused a spark. Spark set off the powder, caused this rod to be shot from the hole like a bullet from a gun barrel. It entered under his left cheek, right. I believe, and emerged the top of his skull. Right. Flew like 60 feet into the air and landed behind him. Right. He flopped onto his back, convulsed a few times, and then started talking. And he was taken to a local, I think it was a hotel, and a physician came to see him and couldn't believe it because he was sitting there and conversing. And the physician was able to take the finger from one hand and put it through the hole under his eye and take a finger from his other hand and push it through the top of his head and have the two fingers meet in his skull inside. Right. And then, you know, when they went and investigated the tapping iron afterwards, there were bits of brain on it, as well as blood. So this guy survived for over a decade. Um, remarkable. Um, but he wasn't the same. And he had initially been very steady, uh, one of the most responsible foremen in the employee of the railroad. And then afterwards, he became extremely emotional, compulsive, swore a lot, couldn't stick to plans, would formulate them, and then quickly change them, and um, so forth. A completely different personality, different person. Right. So we interpreted it in terms of disruptions of the interactions between the top and bottom brain as it went through both of them. And what, what you can see from his behavior is that a lot of it looks uh, very stimulator-like. Uh, plans are executed and then not followed up on, not corrected, not monitored. The consequences aren't uh, being interpreted in great detail and so forth. So we, we interpret it a little differently in terms of the interaction between the top and the bottom as opposed to saying that there's something missing. Okay, so I, I guess what I wanted was the top bottom um, hypothesis or theory, which whichever we want to use, the model that you have presented actually gives us an explanation for Gage's behavior apart from the idea that, well, this part of the brain was damaged and it controls inhibition or this part of it. It gives us a complete understanding of why or how uh, this event indeed changed his behavior, which leads me to this. You point out a potential contradiction to the mover and adapter mode based on research you discussed in Chapter 4. And I have two questions regarding that, Professor. First, how did you resolve the apparent stimulator and perceiver conflict? And second, does this tend to suggest that there's a definite dichotomy between top thinkers and bottom thinkers, a different dichotomy than right and left brain, but a dichotomy nevertheless? So I think if you look in the book, there's a figure where there's over a 1,000 um, data from over a 1,000 people who have taken a test that assesses, assesses top brain, bottom brain thinking just in vision, vision and spatial. Right. And the correlation is virtually zero. It's very, very tiny. Um, but there are so many people involved that it's statistically significant. Um, and, I, and I think if you select people from that cloud, you can get groups of individuals who show that kind of negative relationship. That, that the issue was compensation. Are people who are really good at the top stuff can end up being not so good at the bottom, and vice versa? That that was a theory that somebody had put forth. Mm -hmm. And my own view is it's a single system, and they're inter interacting, so it wouldn't make sense because it's not as if you rely on one leg uh, more than the other, so pretty soon you're going to be hopping just in that leg. Uh, you use both of them. And if one leg is stronger, if anything, the other one may compensate by getting stronger to, to, so that the two can be used well together. I don't know if that metaphor is illuminating or not, but um, 
the, the point I'm trying to make is the idea of the compensation didn't strike me as reasonable. And so we, we went through the literature, which suggested a kind of negative correlation. And my sense of it is that, that it's, it's largely due to selection and a particular task. It's not, not interesting conceptually. It was mostly a methodological exploration in the book. So I, I think if you look at that one figure showing the data from all those people, it pretty much speaks for itself. Right. There is not a negative, a high, a large negative correlation where if you're strong on, on top, you're going to be weaker on the bottom or vice versa. Just empirically, that didn't turn out to be the case. You know, I, I, I so many more questions like, you know, where's the origin? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Uh, you know, how can we employ it? How can we change? Um, da, da, da. Uh, but I suppose I'm going to have to tell our listening audience they need to go to your book and they need to read more because we're just about out of time. In 45 seconds or so, sir, I do want our audience to know how to reach out to you and learn more about you and your work. So if you'd take that 45 seconds to tell them your website, etc., I'd be most uh, happy. To... Sure. Um, just uh, take a look at uh, minerva.kgi.edu. Um, it's the Minerva website, and there's various things on there that I've contributed to, but it also give you a real sense of what we're trying to accomplish here. And let me thank uh, the listeners for being interested in all this, and, and in particular, thank you, sir, for your very thoughtful and provocative questions. I very much enjoy talking to you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure for sure, Dr. Professor Coslin. Uh, it's been indeed my pleasure. And again, the book. Top brain, bottom brain, clear and to the point. These books, I, I, I can't recommend them too strongly. Thank you for your work, Professor Coslin, and for your willingness to share it with us. And I'm sorry, but we have come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. And I want to thank all of you out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. Until then, remember... Believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.